All right, I've got 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Pacific, so no reason to delay. I appreciate all of you who've joined. We might have a few stragglers still coming in, but don't wanna waste any time. Let's go ahead and get started. And I am Jake, as you can see on the screen, not from State Farm, but from an organization called CultureWise. And it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be here with you today uh, and to talk with you about driving company culture specifically in regards to when you have remote or hybrid uh, workplace with teams. So let me go over a quick agenda here for what we're gonna be talking about this afternoon, kind of the flow of the next hour. That first I'll touch briefly on the importance of company culture. Uh, and I'll actually have a question for you all in just a minute that will help me determine how long or how quickly can we move through that. Um, I'll also take just a minute to reflect on the current remote reality. I know it's all a lived experience for us, but sometimes it's good to zoom out and see the big picture. Then we'll really get into the meat of today, starting with the two critical must do's. If you're going to drive culture consistently across your entire organization in the remote reality, what is it that you absolutely need to be doing? And then finally, I'll wrap up with some additional actionable tips that in our experience have proven to make you even more successful in that. Now, I mentioned that in talking company culture, the importance of, I would start with a question for all of you. So let me go ahead and I will put up this poll question here in just a second. And what I wanna determine is how long do we need to spend in this area, right? That I'm, I'm guessing company culture is pretty important if you're here, but let me go ahead and launch this poll. And my question to you is on a scale of one to five with one being completely unrelated or five being absolutely critical and crucial, how important is company culture to your bottom line? Right? So it might be a, a favorite topic for all of us who are joining this webinar, but if you're thinking about your business, right, and from a business standpoint, we're talking about the bottom line, how important is company culture? Again, one being, frankly, it's just not related, Jake, to five. It's absolutely crucial, absolutely critical. So let me give you just a couple more seconds to respond to that. I know we still have some people there, and you're just choosing one of these options. So another five, four, three two and one, and I will end this poll and I'll share with you these results so we can take a look and makes complete sense, right? That you all see that, hey, you're attending this webinar, you probably already think it's important, but we all know, right? That, that culture isn't just a fluffy uh, HR topic and that's no offense to anybody who's a, an HR professional on this call, but it's actually a strategic priority. And we'll talk about why in just a second, but you see it here reflecting the results that almost all of us chose a four or five. There, were, there was a three in there. I know one time we'd asked this question, somebody had it as like a one. And so we just said, you know, you're on this webinar. Why'd you choose a one, whoever that was? And they put in the chat that oh, I hit the wrong button by mistake. All right, so everybody here is a, is a three or above, most of us a four or five, and that makes sense. So I will move through this next piece quickly, reflecting that I don't wanna waste your time, but it's worth revisiting. So we know culture is important, but exactly why? Right? Why does culture actually matter? And so let me move from our poll back to, here we go, our slide. So why does culture matter? I've distilled this down into three uh, critical facets of this. One, working on your culture improves your people's productivity and performance, right? That if you put people in the right environment, they actually raise their level of play to meet the surrounding expectations and standards. And so giving the right support on a team that, that they work well with and in a, in a job that they enjoy and they find rewarding, your people are going to perform better. And sometimes we take that as a given, but it's really crucial to understand, right? That you could put your people with the same skills, talents, and abilities in a different organization 
And they're going to perform differently there, maybe better, maybe worse, but they're going to perform differently because the environment, the culture has that much influence on how people do what they do. So provided that you do culture well, you're going to improve your people's productivity and performance. Obviously, that's going right to the bottom line because outside of some 100% uh, commission position, you're paying your people the same regardless of how productive they are. And so if you've got somebody who's you know, performing at, at 60 or 70% of their capacity, what would it mean to your business if you could raise their level of performance where they were giving you, you know, 80, 90, as close to 100 as possible, and yet you're paying them the same, right? That difference there is going right to your bottom line. The second reason that culture matters is it influences your ability to attract and retain top talent, right? Done well, done right, your culture should be a giant advertisement, kind of the, the flashing neon sign for your organization, broadcasting out to everybody right now who's looking for a job or who's willing to change jobs, and we all know that amount of people is significant right now, saying, those of you who fit us, right, the right people, it's a giant sign to them saying, come look this direction, right, come to work here. This is a place that you're going to be successful, that you're going to feel heard, you're going to be valued, right? This is the kind of place that you want to work. And so it's not just that we have to be out there hunting for the right people, we should be able to leverage our culture to actually attract those people. They should be finding us, right? Knocking on our door to come to work at our organization because of our culture. And oh, by the way, once you get them in the door, just as critical, we've got to make sure that we hold on to them, right? Because right now, as I said, you all know this, that people are looking around, right? Going through a pandemic, going through what we call the great resignation, people are more willing than ever to look around and think, I don't know, is this really the place I want to be? Right? Is this really worth what I'm putting into it? Or maybe there's someplace else. And so we've got to be fighting every single day to make sure that we're retaining our top talent. And you don't want to get into a competition over talent based on what you're willing to pay. Right? A, it's going to be easy for somebody else to beat you. Right? If, just, if, if somebody's staying with us because we're paying X, well, the guy or woman down the road could pay, pay X plus one. Right? It's so easy to beat somebody if that's what we're competing on. And two, that's just not how you wanna run your business, right? You're not gonna be very successful if keeping your best people is reliant on you continually paying them more and more and more, that's cutting into your revenue and your profit. Of course, right, that what you pay, your wages have to be within the ballpark, right? Money does matter, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but every survey, every time people get questioned out there, whether it's Gallup or something else, you can go look through all these studies, it consistently shows that if you're within the same ballpark, then the deciding factor isn't pay. That rather it is, again, whether somebody feels valued, whether they can be successful, whether they feel like they have a voice, all of those things that amount to the working environment, amount to your culture. The third reason that culture matters so much is it should be your most sustainable competitive advantage in your marketplace, right? Let's just face it, that most of us exist in a very commoditized world. Right? Whether you're, you're making something or you're providing a service, other people do what you do. What they can't do is exactly how you do it, how you provide that service, what the experience is like for a, a consumer, a customer, a client when they buy from you or work with you. Right, That experience that differentiates you because somebody else could provide that exact same good or service, but that experience can't be replicated so easily. Right, That can't be copied. They can't do it exactly the same way because that's hard. Right? It's hard to get your people to do it the way that you want it done consistently every single time to provide that great experience. And so that allows us to have a competitive advantage that's just incredibly sustainable. That again, we don't want to be winning new business because we're competing on price, that we're coming in, we're bidding underneath everybody else. That's not a sustainable model. It's not a way to run your business. That rather, if we could be competing based on the experience that we're giving our customers, clients, consumers, that's a winning model, right? And, and that's what culture can do for you. And this isn't just theory, right? That we've actually seen this, that we did a, a, we do an annual survey. We did one last year. So this is from 2021 of our over 400 clients at the time. Now we have close to 600 and we asked them, right? What, what are the benefits from working on culture that you've experienced? And here were the top 10 reasons. I know it's a lot of words on the page, but wanted to show this to you. 
And I kind of bolded and, and kind of highlighted in a way four of these that I think relate directly back to the fact that we're now working in remote and hybrid environments. Number one on the list here is that if you do it right, you create kind of a, a common language, a common vernacular that facilitates better communication across departments. Now, sure, this is important if we're all in the same location and we're all together physically, that still matters. But again, think about how that relates to all of us who work remotely or have hybrid work environments, multiple locations with a distributed workforce. Communication is tough. It frequently breaks down. And anything we can do to create a foundation upon which our people are communicating more effectively, that's going to go a long way toward driving our business successfully. Number three on the list here, greater organizational alignment. Again, a challenge no matter what situation you're facing, but certainly that challenge is multiplied with a distributed workforce in a remote or hybrid environment. Working on culture will help with that. Number seven, more operational consistency across locations and divisions, right? Like how do I get people to do things the same way every single time, no matter whether you're working from home or you're at a different location or you're, you're in the office some days of the work, but you're out other days when we're not all together, you don't have that example of people just being able to see how you as a leader do it. So what are we putting in place to help our people create consistent experiences for our customers or clients to go about their work in a consistent way, to interact with each other in a productively consistent way? Well, work on your culture. And then the last one I highlighted here is reduce the degree of silo thinking. So again, how do we get our people to, to share information, to collaborate, to work together efficiently when they're as distributed as they are in a remote or hybrid environment, working on your culture will give you that benefit. So shifting gears, right? So we briefly touched the importance of culture. Again, thinking back to that poll question, I know virtually everybody here had it as a, as a four or five, the importance as it relates to their bottom line. So I know you all agree that culture is important, but wanted to share that with you. But let's shift, shift gears for just a second and reflect on the remote or hybrid work environment that we're experiencing. That I know that, you know, all of us have been headed this way for, for a time. Some of us happened to get here because of the pandemic. Others of us were doing before that. And it's all been a lived experience for us. You all have your own experiences from it. But I want to zoom out for a second and just give you the broad overview that sometimes that helps us contextualize and, and realize what everybody else is going through as well. So right here, just starting with the base comparison to prior to the pandemic, prior to COVID, what was it like? What were the work environments like? Sure, there were some people working remotely, right? And if you have multiple locations or distributed workforce, maybe you have truckers on the road or, or home health personnel who are going into people's homes or things like that, to some degree, you've always been working in a remote or hybrid environment, yet there's been a vast sea change in the percentage of businesses employees working that way. Because prior to COVID, 75% of Americans had never worked from home. Right. What about now, how we work now? 68% of the workforce say they prefer working remotely. So, right? We went from three out of four people saying they'd never done it before to now, what, seven out of 10, almost the same um, percentage wise, saying that, you know what, I like this. I'd rather be doing it that way. And you know, a little bit more on how people feel about it. 74%, this was a study done in 2021, 74% of people, so three out of four, say that they would quit their job if forced to return to the office full time, right? I, I know statistics, you know, take it for what it's worth. But even if this is like somehow wildly inflated, right, even if by a measure of, of a third, right, even if it was only 50% of people, that still is an outstanding or, or astounding statistic, right? That that many people say they would leave their job over whether they're able to work remotely or not, right? Something that we have to be responding to as leaders. Uh, a second part to this about how our people feel, right? We talked about, would you leave the job? Well, how about, would you give up money, right? Would you take less in order to work from home, work remotely, avoid in-office work? And sure enough, more than half, 61% of people say, yeah, right, sign me up for that. I would actually take less money because my working environment the freedom that comes with this, the flexibility, it's that important to me, right? And so again, as leaders, wow, that's a lot to grapple with. If our people feel that strongly, it's a lot to, a lot to grapple with. And again, I, I know most of you have experienced this in your own organizations, but it's good sometimes to reflect and see that big picture. 
And I'd love to know what's going on currently in your organizations, right? Remote, hybrid, what stances have you taken there? So let me put up our second poll question here. Uh, so we all, we see what others are doing and you can share what you're doing. Let me go ahead and launch this poll. And what I'm asking you to do here in this poll as it launches is to describe your current policy in re with regards to remote or hybrid work. So do you, are you fully remote that all of your employees uh, can work remote all of the time? Do you have a hybrid environment where some employees or some positions can work remotely while others do not or, or cannot, right? If you've got people in a warehouse, they can't work remotely, right? They have to be on site. Do you have a hybrid environment where people come in for some days and stay out for others, right? Maybe two or three days a week, they're in the office, two or three days a week, they're out. Um, or maybe you're still figuring it out, right? That not all of us have been able to just jump in and get this completely solved right away. Maybe you're still trying to figure out that policy. So let me give it just five, four, three, two, and one as people make their decisions. And I will end this poll and share with you the results. And this is interesting. I, I appreciate you all responding to this. So let me share these results with you. So you can see a pretty mixed bag here, right? That we've got a large percentage of people uh, so uh, almost half of us who are attending this right now said they're in a hybrid environment where some employees, some positions are able to work remotely, but others either cannot or do not, right? So it could be the nature of the industry. Like I said, if it's construction or, or, or distribution with a warehouse, right? People can't work remotely for certain positions, uh, or maybe some people just chose not to. But then we're pretty spread through the other options. We've got a significant number of people, right? More than 10% still figuring it out. Definitely can understand that. About a similar percentage that have all gone fully remote, and then a good chunk, about a quarter, where some people are coming in for a few days a week and staying out for others. So interesting to see, I appreciate you sharing that. What I take from that though, right, uh, as a whole, put it all together, is that you're not gonna ignore this elephant, right? It's something that we're grappling with. It's something that we're dealing with as leaders. We're not just gonna be able to brush it aside, right? And, and, and I think we were getting here regardless, right? I, I've read things, I don't have a, a study or a quote right in front of me to relate to you, but I remember reading things that said, you know what, these trends were already in place. We were probably going to get here regardless because of the advances in technology and, and the different generations and how they treat work-life balance and that sort of thing. But because of the pandemic, the time frame was just significantly compressed, right? What was a trend occurring across maybe six to 10 years happened in six to 10 months. And we already know how people to react to change. You compress the time frame that much and you have that big of a change and you're gonna get dramatic reactions, right? You're gonna get the great resignation. You're gonna get people or great migration as people move between jobs, not just resigning. You're gonna get people who are frustrated. As leaders, we're not gonna know right away how to deal with this or what's the best way. Or we might make a policy that, that we think makes sense and yet is taken differently by our employees because this is a dramatic change. And when you have dramatic change in a compressed time frame, that's the kind of reaction that you're going to get. But we have to deal with it, right? As leaders, this is our responsibility. And if you don't, what you stand to lose is exactly what made you special, right? Thinking back to the importance of company culture, those three ideas that I distilled it down, that if you don't have a more systematic process to create, drive, and sustain your culture, then what you stand to lose is your people's productivity, right? What you stand to lose is your ability to attract and retain your top talent. What you stand to lose is your ability literally to win new business, to be competitive in your commoditized marketplace, right? And so the, the, the cartoon there, if you've taken the time to, to read it, just speaks to this idea of if we're not being more systematic, when we're working in a remote or hybrid environment, when we've got people you know, spread to the four winds, it is tough to drive consistent culture, that people are gonna make decisions, they're gonna interpret how we've defined our culture and what we want them to do in wildly different ways, absent some sort of intentional force. And so it's on us as leaders to provide that intentional force. So that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of today going forward. But before we do that, just a, a quick comment that I wanna make, that everything that we're gonna talk about going forward, everything I'm gonna share with you, over about the next, what, 40 minutes or so that we've got remaining here is not, is not the difference between success and failure, right? I, I just wanna be real with you up front. 
right? Most of you on this call aren't already doing these things. I, I might have a few current clients with us today, just learning to glean a little, looking to glean a little more and, and happy to have you here. But most of you aren't practicing what I'm about to share. And yet you're probably already running very successful businesses, right? This is not the difference between success and failure. Instead, what we're discussing today is really the difference between being good and being truly great, running an extraordinary organization that has true operational consistency in terms of how your people operate and behave, you know, kind of cliche, but the line there on the, on the screen, not just thrive or not just survive, but how do you thrive, right? And we've got a saying that we often use that was first said by our founder and CEO, David Friedman, in his book, Culture by Design, that good companies have good cultures by chance. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, right? Rather, what I mean by that is if you're a good leader, right? You naturally are already doing a lot of things right, a lot of things well around culture, right? Because you don't need to, uh, a consultant or to read a book or to attend a webinar, right? To tell you to treat your people well, right? That that makes a difference, that matters, right? You're already doing a lot of good things. And just by the nature of your personality, you're attracting like-minded people, right? So you're getting people who think similarly and, and approach things the same way and that sort of thing. For the most part, on average, you've already built a pretty good company. The difference is that world-class championship, extraordinary cultures have world or companies have world-class culture by design, right? So the best companies, the best organizations are incredibly intentional and systematic in everything they do around company culture. Why? Because it's just that important. Again, thinking back to what we discussed just a moment ago, in some ways, if there was just a single lever you could pull that would have the most dramatic impact on your business, it's got to be culture, right? Working on your culture. It's got to be because it, it affects so many aspects of your operation. It affects whether people want to do work with you or buy from you. It affects how productive your people are. It affects whether people join and stay at your organization, right? Culture impacts all of that. And so the best companies, the extraordinary ones, do everything they can incredibly intentionally to create, drive, and sustain a culture that supports that. And that's what I'm going to share with you going forward. Now, there's really two critical must-dos that have to happen in order to drive culture the way we're talking about, at the level I'm talking about, in a remote or hybrid environment. For those of you on this call who are current clients or already practicing the ideas that we shared, whether we helped you implement them or you did it on your own, bear with me during this section of the webinar. It's important that I go through this for everybody, right? And for you, it's going to be a refresher, but I appreciate you being bearing with me. I will get to some additional actionable items after we get through these next two steps. For everybody else, I really want you to focus in here, right? That if there's nothing else you take away from today, it's these two points that I'm going to go over, right? If you do these two things well, you're going to be, you know, 70, 80% of where you need to be. Then there's other things you can do. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is really the meat of the matter. The two critical must do's. If you don't do these things, it doesn't really matter what other things you try to do, right? You're, you're putting icing on without the cake, right? But here's the cake. Here's the meat of the matter. So number one, you have to get crystal clear about how you define your culture. Everybody has to be on the same page about how you operate because that's really what culture is, right? Culture isn't you know, a ping pong table in a break room. It's not a casual Friday or a pizza party after hours or something like that. Those are all good things. Right? That all says something about that you care about your people and, and you want them to have fun and enjoy themselves and that sort of thing. But that doesn't define your culture. Culture is how your people operate. It's how they go about their work. It's how they interact with each other. Certainly, it's how they serve your customers, your clients. And so the more that you can be clear with your people about exactly what that looks like, what should they be doing? How should they act? How should they operate? The more consistently they're going to live up to that culture that you want them to. And so that's why we say that you should define your culture in terms of clear behaviors as opposed to the more traditional kind of conventional mission, vision, values paradigm. That's not to say, I want to be real clear here, because I don't want somebody to take this the wrong way. I am not saying that mission, vision, and values are not important or are not impactful or that you shouldn't take steps to define those. I'm not saying that at all. 
that core values speak to what your organization stands for, what you all believe in, right? who you are as an organization. Behaviors, though, are kind of the logical next step that make it, uh, I guess, even more clear to our people on a daily basis. What should they be doing every day? What are the actions that they should take to be successful in our organization? And I'll get into that in just a second, the real difference between values versus behaviors, how I'm using those words and, and what that means and how it applies. But suffice to say for right now, that we're suggesting you define your culture in terms of a clear set of behaviors rather than just core values. The second, and equally as important, right? These are ranked in order of, um, I guess, uh, you know, chronology. You have to do step one before you do step two, but I'm not ranking them in order of importance. These are equally as important. So step two, equally as important, once you have a clear set of behaviors, you then have to systematically teach and practice those behaviors in a sustainable way in a way that's going to last, that this isn't going to be, you know, the flavor of the month or something we do, you know, for three or six months and then it falls by the wayside. We're going to make it last through this concept that we call rituals. So you want to systematically teach and practice those behaviors by leveraging this idea of rituals. As we use that word, you could think of as habits or routines. And again, just a minute, I'll go further in depth there and explain that. But I want to take just a second to see where you all are, right? So I'm going to do another poll question here to see where you all are in terms of how do you currently define your culture, right? What steps have you taken, if at all? So let me go ahead and launch the poll. And the question I'm asking is, what steps have you taken to define your culture? And your choice is that maybe you defined a mission, vision, and core values. Maybe you've defined daily behaviors that drive how you operate. Maybe you've taken steps to do both. You have your mission, vision, and values, and you've also defined a set of behaviors. Maybe you haven't taken any steps yet to define your culture. That's okay. That's why you're here today. I'm sharing with you how you might do that. So let me give this a few more seconds as you decide which most closely fits where you're at as an organization. We've had about two thirds of our people answer so far. So let me give it just a, a few more seconds to get everybody an opportunity. I'll give it five, four, three, two, and one. And let me go ahead and end this and I will share the results. And two pretty distinct results here that we've got a large segment of those attending, almost half of us, just a little under half, who've defined a mission, vision, and core values. And uh, so I appreciate you being here today as I share with you what I kind of consider the logical next step. And so I appreciate you being open-minded in hearing something that might be a little bit different from how you've thought about culture before. Um, so I appreciate your, your willingness to try on something new and, and give me a chance to explain our approach. Then another little less than half, but significant amount of us who've done both the mission, vision, values, and the behavior. So maybe you're clients of ours, or you've heard our ideas before and taken it on on your own. So I appreciate you bearing with me as we go through these first two steps that you should know pretty well. It might be an additional uh, piece of information you pick up as you listen over the next few minutes, and then we'll shift gears to some additional actionable items that I think you'll find very helpful in terms of your practice in driving your culture. So I'll stop sharing that poll and bring us back to the slides here. And I wanna get into this first step, right? So we said the first step in this is that you've gotta define your culture in terms of a clear set of behaviors. So first, let me explain the difference for those of you who aren't familiar with how we're using those words and, and what's the distinction? Because we make a really big deal about the distinction between values versus behaviors. So a value as I'm using that word is an idea. It's a belief, it's a notion. Right, parts of speech, think of it as a noun, right? Some, some typical core values that I put on here, things like integrity, quality, respect, innovation, right? These are ideas, beliefs, notion, things that, that speak to what we stand for as an organization. Whereas a behavior, on the other hand, is an action. It's something that, that people do or, or don't do, right? It's a behavior. So examples, behaviors that we practice in our own organization are things like honor commitments, right? Do what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. Practice blameless problem solving. Be a fanatic about response time. Follow up on everything, right? These are actions. These are things that you're gonna be able to see whether I did it or not. And so, you know, I mentioned values, kind of a noun, behaviors you could think of as a verb. Right. So, so why does this all matter, this distinction between them? Well, just based on their very nature, values tend to be more broad, more vague, more nebulous. And so they can mean a lot of different things or be interpreted 
a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. Right? The, the, the example that I use almost every time, if you've attended our webinars, you've probably heard it before, um, whether it's from me or, or my colleague, Bill Kaiser, is respect. Right? Who wouldn't want to work in an organization that values respect? Of course I would, right? But what does that actually mean? <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, just based on where you grew up, how you were raised, different cultures and customs, you might have a wildly different interpretation of what that means to show respect. I, I think of myself that I grew up in Southern New Jersey, really a suburb of Philadelphia, but across the Delaware River there in Southern New Jersey. And I never said the terms, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, until I joined the military and was down in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And then I was saying it all the time, right? And, and so today I live down in Gainesville, Florida. I've got two kids and, and they're raised to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, where I am in really North Central Florida, it's still mainly the South. And so they say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, all the time. That's how they show respect to people who are older than them. When I go back home, right? If I were to go back to the, the center city, Philadelphia, and I say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, to somebody, right? That, that's not respect. They're going to look at me like I've got two heads, right? Or, or I'm making fun of them, right? That's, that's just weird, right? So just based on that, where we come from, how we were raised, our different beliefs, values can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. A behavior, on the other hand, because it's action-oriented, because it's something that people do, it's a lot easier for me as an employee to know what's expected of me. How can I be successful for you all as leaders? to teach and coach and guide and give people feedback on it because you can clearly see, right? Honoring commitments. You either arrived when you said you would today or you didn't, right? You either sent somebody that proposal, that document when you said you'd have it to them or you did not, right? So it's so much easier. Again, this is all about clarity. This isn't about trying to be different from the rest of the world and how we talk about culture. This isn't about trying to create our own niche or, or anything like that or be counter culture or anything like that. This is just about what does it take to truly operationalize culture? And in our experience, having done this almost 600 times across organizations of, of virtually every shape and size and every industry that you can imagine, what we found is the level of clarity needed, you're going to get through defining behaviors. So if you've never defined core values before, you nece don't necessarily have to. You could just go right into defining behaviors as long as you're telling people, your people clearly, what do they need to be doing every single day? If you've already taken steps to define core values, your mission, vision, values, like you know, 46% of you have on this call, I'm not saying you need to abandon those, right? If they're real, if they're genuine, if your people know them, then just take the logical next step and now define the clear set of behaviors that allow your people to live up to those core values on a daily basis. Some tips here, if you're gonna go ahead and do this and write behaviors, what does that actually look like? So here's an example. I, I use practice blameless problem solving, a behavior that we practice. And you'll see that for every single behavior, we write a title like practice blameless problem solving, and then a short description. Normally it's two to four sentences. That's what you see in this graphic below there that starts with apply your creativity, spirit, and enthusiasm. And as you read through that, what I want you to notice is that when we write behaviors, we're trying to be concise and yet create clarity. But importantly, these aren't philosophical expressions of belief, right? Rather, they're directives for people so they know what to do, how to operate, right? We're telling our people how to be successful versus expressing what we all believe in or what we know to be true, right? So when we talk about practice blameless problem solving in the description here, if you read through it, you'll see it doesn't say something like, you know, we believe that people work better in a blameless environment because it allows them to step outside their comfort zone and try new things and foster creativity without fear of reprisal, right? All very true. I think that is the, the impact of a blameless environment. That's why it's so important to practice this behavior, but that's not what we're writing in the description, right? That's an expression of belief. That's a philosophical statement. Rather, the question that we're trying to answer in writing these behaviors is, what do you want your people doing every day, right? What is it that you want your people doing that will lead to success here? And that's the standpoint from which you're writing these behaviors. Of course, you can't possibly cover, right, every shade of gray, nuance, hypothetical in a description. So don't try to, 
right? You, you don't want to write a massive paragraph, a thesis here, just a few short sentences to give people greater clarity, right? That's the goal always clarity. So we're trying to flesh out a little bit more from this title. What do we mean by practice blameless problem solving? You're not going to cover everything. That's why we're going to talk about our second step that we've got to systematically teach and coach this, give our people the opportunity to practice it over and over and over and over again. But we want to write this with clarity in mind. And whether you use us to, to help in that or you decide to go down this path on your own, that's what will you want to have in your head as you're thinking about defining your behaviors. We give those behaviors a name. We call them fundamentals, but whatever you want to call them, whether you call them fundamentals or, you know, we've got clients who call them other things, you know, maxims, essentials, things like that. We're saying the same thing, that we're trying to create a set of clear behaviors that define our culture. Now, the second critical must do, once you have your list of well-defined behaviors, what do we do with it? Well, we can't just post it on a wall. We can't just hand it out to people, right? Clarity alone doesn't get our people to do what we want them to do, right? If it did, then shoot, all those times we you know, shouted at somebody to do it differently, we wouldn't have to shout it any more times. But what do you find yourself doing as a leader? You find yourself constantly repeating the same things over and over and over and over again to get your people to do them, and yet they don't do them right. Why not? Because we've never put in place a systematic effort to consistently, not just episodically, but consistently and systematically teach and coach and for them to practice those behaviors we want them to do so that they internalize them. So they do them at a really high level, right? The only way people get good at something, whether it's a, a sport you played or, or an instrument or you've learned a foreign language and you're fluent now, right? The only way you master, you get good at anything in life is to practice it over and over and over and over again. And yet most people don't love doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? Practice is hard. So we say that let's use, let's leverage a concept that we call rituals in order to make that practice sustainable, right? So what is a ritual? You know, think of a daily life, some rituals that you see in daily life. Again, you could sub in the word habit or routine if you chose. There's a picture here of the, the Trenton Thunder. This was the, the minor league team that I grew up visiting, going to see at the, their ballpark in Trenton, New Jersey. Right? And what did they do before every first pitch of every game? What do you see in most professional or collegiate sports before the kickoff of the football game, tip off of the basketball game, whatever it might be? Well, we sing the national anthem. Right? And the reason that's so important, not the anthem itself, but the ritual of it, is that's what ensures that it happens every single time, not just most of the time or when it's convenient enough. Right? When you're walking into the stadium that day, I've never heard anybody say, and I've certainly never thought to myself, you know, I wonder if they're going to sing the national anthem today. No, it, it's just a given. Of course they are. That's what we do every single time. It's a ritual. Another example of a ritual in daily life, and this is a little bit silly, but I think it makes the point well. So, so bear with me through the silly analogy. You can see the picture there, brushing your teeth, right? Think about the ritualized way with which you brush your teeth, that you wake up in the morning, you take two minutes to brush your teeth. Before you go to bed at night, you brush again for two more minutes, right? It's not hard to do. Right now, my three-year-old daughter, right, she'll debate with you whether she's going to brush her teeth or not. Right, but but outside of that, once it's become a habit, a routine, a ritual, it's not hard. I'm guessing nobody here has the the calendar in their bathroom, like checking off the days to make sure that they brush their teeth. Right, or better yet, the Excel spreadsheet. Right, oh, got to make sure I enter that I brush my teeth today. Got to stay consistent with it, and yet you do it every single day, every morning, every evening to the point where it's so ingrained, so muscle memory. I know there's days where I'm almost like, did I, right? Because it's such a given part of the routine, you almost forget about it. It's not hard. It's not difficult to remember, but you do it every single day because it's become a routine, it's become a ritual. That's why this concept is so important, right? In a minute, I'm about to relate it back to what we've been talking about in terms of these behaviors. But let me finish up making the point about why this idea, this concept of rituals matters is because rituals are what make things last. It's what allows something to be sustainable for us as human beings who struggle sticking with things to stick with something far longer than we ever would based on our own internal discipline. Because let's face it, most people and thus most organizations aren't tremendously disciplined. And again, I'm not trying to be condescending about that. I'm the exact same way, right? If I think about my personal life, I grew up in a family of runners 
and I know how important it is to run, right? You don't need to educate me on the health benefits. I, I know it's good for me physically, mentally. I know my wife tells me I'm a, I'm a better husband when I run more often because it affects my mood, right? And so I know it's important to run. And yet as I've gotten older, I've gotten away from it. And so every once in a while, I'll decide, you know what? I really need to start running again. And so I will, right? I'll, I'll go out for a run every day for a week or two weeks. I'll be on this great streak. And then there'll be some reason why I can't get up that next day and run, right? I'm traveling for work or I've got a sick kid or I don't feel well. Who knows what the reason is? There's some very valid excuse why I can't do it. And I'll do it tomorrow, right? And I probably will. But then there'll be another valid excuse after that. And then another one, and another one, another one. And soon enough, I'm no longer running anymore, right? We've seen it, the cartoon here. It's, it's the, the New Year's resolutions, right? The diet plans, the exercise plans. We start them so well-intentioned. I think we're serious about it, right? We're not doing it flippantly. We're not trying not to stick with it. You don't need to tell us the benefits. We know the benefits. It's just hard because of human nature. People just aren't wired, most of us anyway, aren't wired to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's tremendously difficult. But if we could replace the need to be disciplined, with, which most people aren't, with this idea of rituals or routines or habits, well, shoot. Now it's no longer hard to do. Now it's no longer difficult to remember. Now it's going to last. And this isn't some genius idea that you know I cooked up or we at CultureWise cooked up. Right? Think about this idea of rituals, routines, habits. People have been using this for thousands of years. Right? Look to religion, look to current books, the power of habit, atomic habit. Right? We know this stuff. We just now need to apply it to how we drive culture. So how does this actually work? How do we apply this? to our methodology in terms of driving culture consistently, there's an overarching, what we call cyclical ritual that will drive your practice of the behaviors that define your culture. That no matter how many behaviors you decide to define, and the number doesn't really matter, and I'll speak to that in just a second, you're gonna have your people focus on just one behavior, one fundamental, again, as we call it, a week. Right? Of course, you want your people using all of these all the time, doing them all the time. But in terms of singling one out for extra attention, extra practice, we're just going to do one per week so it's not overwhelming. So in week number one, once we're up and running, you know, it's, it's fundamental or behavior number one. Week number two, it's number two. The week after that, number three, and so on and so forth, all the way through your list, no matter how many it is. And when you reach the end, you just go back to the beginning and you go through it again. And then you do it again and again and again and again. And you're going to do this for the rest of your life, or at least, you know, your career, right? If these are the most important behaviors, the things that drive our success in your organization, then we never want to stop practicing it. Now, in just a second, I'll talk about, well, exactly what do you do during the week, right? Because there's some weekly rituals that you'll do to structure your practice. I'll get to that in just a minute. But first, let me go back and just address what is probably a natural question that most of you or many of you might be thinking right now, which is, so how many behaviors should we practice, right? How many make sense? If you're looking at the screen here and you can see, I know it's a little bit blurry, this is a layout, a, a card production of the behaviors that we practice, our fundamentals here at CultureWise, High Performing Culture is our, our technical name. And you'll see there's 30 of these, right? 30 behaviors that we practice. Some of you are probably, you know, your mind is exploding right now. How is that even possible? You know, maybe, maybe it works for you, Jake, but I guarantee you, you know, my people aren't practicing 30 things. There's no way they could even remember 30 things, right? They could never memorize this. And you're right. They probably couldn't. But what's the goal, right? Is the goal for us to give our people something to memorize, to recite, you know, Jake, what's number 17? Or is the goal to teach our people to help them get better at, to internalize whatever's necessary for them to be successful and for us to be successful as an organization. I mean, obviously I think it's the latter. And then I compare it again to myself as a young parent with a six-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. Am I going to restrict the things I teach my children to just what they could recite or memorize? Or as a parent, do I feel responsibility to teach them everything they need to learn to grow up to be successful, functioning, you know, uh, self-respecting adults? Again, I think it's the latter. Now, if we just dump all this on them, right? So we've got 30. If somebody were to throw me 30 things and say, all right, Jake, these are important, start practicing them. You're right. It's, it's not going to go very well. That's just overwhelming. But again, if we focus on just one thing per week, then it's not overwhelming, right? I don't need to look at all 30 of these things at once. I'm just focused on one at a time. So the question isn't how many I should have. Rather, the question is, 
what are the behaviors that drive success? And however many you come up with, then that's your number. But we're just going to practice one per week. Now, within a week, what is it that we're going to be doing, right? What does this actually look like? Because you want to structure this in a way where it doesn't feel like one more thing on your people's plate, right? That it's not taking up a ton of their time, effort, and energy. That rather, you know, rule of thumb, two to five minutes out of their day, maybe 15 to 20 minutes total per week, right? So that this isn't asking a lot. And you want to kind of diffuse their, or, or spread out those touch points by which you're teaching and they're practicing and you're engaging your people in this throughout the week so that we're not just taking, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes on Monday and now we don't talk about it again the rest of the week, but rather if we could take two minutes on Monday and two minutes on Wednesday and four minutes on Friday, that's going to be a lot more effective. So what could this look like? Here's one example, what we call the first agenda item. And this is the idea that at the beginning of any meeting that you have, or you could restrict it to just specific meetings, but the beginning of any meeting that you have, your people, whoever's in that meeting, are going to spend just the first few minutes, the first couple minutes, I mean that very literally, right, two, three, five minutes max of that meeting, talking about the behavior, the fundamental that you're working on that week. Why is it so important? What's a recent example? What's something we could do to get better at it? Maybe how does it relate to another fundamental or something like that? It's a real quick conversation. You don't want to create new meetings just to talk about this, right? That'd be a waste of people's time. You don't want to take over the meeting, right? It's not a 10 or 15 minute conversation. Now our meeting has to run late. That's not sustainable. But if you could use just the first couple minutes of a meeting that your people are already in, to teach and coach and practice the behavior that you're working on that week that you know is crucial to their success and your success as an organization, that's a wonderful opportunity to help your people internalize this and get better at it. And again, this doesn't have to be in a formal, right? I've got the, the picture of an agenda here, but I've also got the picture of people in a warehouse. This doesn't have to be some formal, you know, sit down thing where we're all in a boardroom, right? That maybe you've got at the beginning of every shift in your warehouse or out in the field and on a construction site, Maybe once a week you do a, a toolbox talk or a safety chat or something like that. We'll just use the first couple minutes of that, right? And the more effective you can make that conversation versus just checking the box, the more valuable it will be, the more sustainable, sustainable it'll be. And I'll speak to that later when I talk about some actionable uh, items that will make your practice even more effective. So that's just one example. There's a lot of other ways to do this. We've even created a mobile app that helps automate some of these rituals. So for example, every single day in our organization, we get a daily quick tip. It's just two to three sentences. It's, it's one thought to take with you as you go about your day pertaining to the behavior, the fundamental that we're working on that week. But as crazy as life gets, as busy as work is, every single day, I get a little push notification, a little notice, one thought to take with me as I go about my day, that keeps this top of mind, that keeps me engaged, that keeps me thinking about our fundamentals. So there's lots of ways you could do this. That was just one example. But you want to have those rituals structured in such a way where it doesn't feel like a burden. You're really not asking that much of your people, right? Two to five minutes out of their day, and you spread it out throughout the week so that there's multiple touch points during which you're engaging your people. If you do that, and you do it over and over, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year after year. Again, you're never going to stop. There's just no way your people wouldn't get better, right? There's no way they wouldn't internalize these, master these behaviors, because that's how people learn, right? And that's the whole idea. So those two critical must-dos, again, just as a, a quick review here, you've got to define your culture in terms of clear behaviors, and then equally as important, once you have that list, you have to systematically teach and practice those behaviors by leveraging this idea of rituals. That's what's going to make it last. That's what's going to make it sustainable versus it being, you know, the big meeting that we held once. Everybody was rah, rah. And we all said, this is such a great idea. Three months, six months, a year down the road. Whatever happened to that, right? This can't be that. This can't be the flavor of the month. It's got to be an operating system that helps drive your culture for years to come. And you do that through rituals. All right. What, though, are some additional actionable tips, right? I said we've done this almost 600 times. What makes organizations more or less successful? What are other things that you can do to make your practice of those behaviors, those fundamentals, even more effective? Three things that we've seen. One, it makes a huge difference if you take the time to introduce your culture to all employees the right way, right? And, and that could be if you're just putting this system in place, it could be a huge rollout where you're engaging everybody. It matters when you hire new hires after that rollout who weren't a part of that process. 
right? What are we saying to them? How does that work? Maybe from time to time, you do a refresh through the whole company. So I'll speak to that in just a second. The second step here, creating a curriculum for your leaders, your frontline supervisors, managers, team leaders to teach from is going to allow your people to be that much more consistent in their ability to internalize these behaviors. So again, I'll speak to that in just a minute. And then finally, using technology, right? It's almost such a no brainer that it goes without saying, and yet our ability to use technology effectively to connect our people to each other and to our culture goes a long way, especially in a remote and hybrid environment over whether we'll be able to do this successfully. So we'll go into this first one, this idea of taking the time to introduce it to everybody the right way. So having done, again, work with hundreds of clients, we've developed a best practice on introducing this that we call the rollout. And, and I'll share that with you now. You could put your own spin on this. I'm not saying you have to do it that way. I'm just sharing something that we've found to be really successful and that we've noticed is such a crucial piece in whether an organization goes on to have success with this methodology or not, because it's, it's kind of setting the table for success, right? Or, or preparing the soil is sometimes the analogy we use. That if you prepare the soil the right way, then the seeds that you plant there are much more likely to prosper and grow. And so the same is true of the rollout, how you introduce it. That you've probably seen this before, whether it's in your organization or, or that of a peer, you can have a really great idea but if you don't introduce it right, if you don't message it correctly from the beginning, you know, people take it in wildly different directions than you intended, right? Something that you're putting in place really to benefit them, right? We're trying to build the best possible organization for our people to work in so they can perform at their highest levels. Really, we're doing this for them. And yet you'll find people be, you know, suspicious or cynical or, or defensive about it. It's like, wait a minute, that, that's not what I intended as a leader, right? So we've got to introduce it correctly. So what does that look like? We hold what we call rollout meetings, where we do these sessions for an organization with maybe 30 to 50 people total at a time, because we want it to be an engaging and interactive session. You don't want this to be a presentation, right? You don't want to be talking at your people. That's going to turn them off. But rather, if you could draw them in, if you could engage them, allow them to think through, to discuss both in small groups and as a whole group, okay, so what are these behaviors, these fundamentals? And how do we use them each day? How do they apply to what I do here as an employee? So which fundamentals really resonated, jumped out to them that they say, oh yeah, I just think that's so important. Here's how I see it applying. Which ones maybe do they think, you know, they agree with, but it sounds good on paper. It's another thing to really do this in real life, right? Which ones are gonna be difficult to actually do maybe because of their personality, just the way they're wired, it's, it's tough for them, maybe past experience they've had or the current position they're in with the pressures and deadlines and workload. So which of these behaviors sound good on paper but might be more difficult to do? And then, like I said, how do we actually use these, right? Let's make it practical for people. Let's bring it from an abstract idea up here, really down to earth so they understand, you know, this is a guide for how to operate. And that if I practice these fundamentals, I'm going to be empowered as an employee to make decisions, to think through situations, to solve problems. That's really what you're giving your people a guidebook. So illustrate for them, right? Develop some kind of common workplace scenarios, illustrate for them how to use this. Oh, by the way, right, maybe as a remote or hybrid environment, maybe we have to do this through Zoom. We do that all the time, right? These days, we do about half of these meetings in person, about half of them by Zoom. It's just as impactful. So if you can't bring all your people together, if logistically, financially, whatever it might be that people have to get on, we've done this with you know, construction organizations, with people out in the field in a truck on their phone and things like that, pretty much every setting you can imagine, grab everybody in on a Zoom call. You can still have a great conversation discussion. You can still have a great rollout meeting through Zoom in a remote or hybrid environment. Now, maybe despite the fact that your people work remotely, maybe you do have the ability and the resources to bring everybody together and do this kind of meeting in person. I think it's worth doing if you've got that shot. There's something about bringing everybody together, especially when they aren't together very often, that just makes this a little special, that adds something to the impact, to the energy in the room, that gives people a chance to, to, to learn from each other and share their own perspective. And so bring people together, make it an event, make it that special kind of thing, bring people together and, and do some sort of rollout meeting like I described. Now, if you've already done this, right? What if you go through the rollout, if you've already done it? What about those new hires, right? That 
one of the things that we've created for our organization and many of our clients have done is what we call a way card. That's what you see there in the middle of the screen. It's what you saw earlier listing our 30 fundamentals. It has your behaviors printed on it with your logo branding colors. Shoot from the first time you're talking to a potential new hire, definitely to when they're coming on board their first week, they should have this way card in their hand. Right? They should be reflecting on this already. You could be posing interview questions about this. You know, Which of these fundamentals resonated with you? Which ones do you think are going to be difficult for you? That sort of thing. So they're already starting to engage it. Certainly, when they come on board, their, their first week or first two weeks, those are maybe the most important weeks they'll spend in your organization. This is our chance to set the tone, right? to really um, I, I, I trust you'll hear this in the right way, brainwash our people to see things the way we want them to see them. And so we've got to be careful and, and intentional and systematic in driving culture from the moment a new hire sets foot in our organization. And like I said, really before that in the interview process. For those of you who are already doing things like that and you're practicing a system like I've described, again, whether you've done it on your own or we've helped you put it in place from time to time, because again, you're practicing this for years, maybe you do a refresh. We've done this for many clients that, hey, it's been three years. We've got a whole bunch of new hires that, yeah, we introduced this as they came on board and they practice with us each week, but they never went through that initial rollout. Let's get everybody together, right? Maybe it's everybody who's been you know, hired since the last time. Maybe it's the whole company. Again, maybe we bring people together in person. Maybe it's through Zoom. We can do that. This works in a remote or hybrid environment the exact same way, but let's make sure that we're introducing our culture, the way we're operating, consistently to all of our employees. Another thing that you can do to be successful is create a curriculum for your kind of middle managers, uh, junior leaders. I don't mean junior in a uh, like a, an age or tenure sense, but in terms of role and position, kind of direct supervisors, managers, team leaders, right? Most of the time, those people came up through the ranks, right? That they got to the position they're at because they've been with us a while and they've been successful and they've learned things on the job as they went. And so they've got great institutional knowledge of your business, but they're not necessarily ever been trained in how to teach and coach and drive culture. And yet we're going to put that on them, right? They're, they're the team leader. They're the person our employees are going to be interacting with most often. So let's set them up for success, right? Create something that's going to help them. What should they be saying about this? How do they coach people? How do they run these rituals, right? So you see the example here, we create coaching guides. Right? We've got a coaching guide for our 30 fundamentals for every single one that has key teaching points. Right? What are we saying when we talk about this behavior? One-on-one -on -one coaching tips. Right? Like if I've got somebody who's struggling, a teammate, an employee, how do I help them? What might they want to think about? What could I say to that person? So one-on-one -on -one coaching tips, questions for discussion. Right? So uh, relating back to that idea of a ritual, a possible ritual, you could use the first agenda item using the first couple minutes of any meeting to practice your behaviors rather than just saying, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's my, you know, customer service team lead saying, all right, you know, who's got an example of honoring commitments? Hey, the first time we run through it, that'll probably be okay, right? Because it's new and it's fresh and everybody's going to be thinking of an example. By the time you come back around for a second spin, a third spin through that week, right? That's not going to be effective. It's going to feel like checking the box and people are going to start to be disengaged and you're going to lose impact. But if somebody had a coaching guide with seven, eight, nine, ten 10 discussion questions to choose from to make sure it stays relevant, to keep people engaged, it's going to be that much more impactful, right? And I'm not saying you have to engage us, right? This is something you could create on your own, and it doesn't even have to be exactly how we would do it. But the more you can build for your people, especially those direct supervisors, team leaders, managers, a curriculum through which to teach and coach and drive culture, the more effective they're going to be, the more consistent results you're going to see across the organization. The final tip that I'll share with you, like I said, it's almost a no brainer, but, but I'll call it out, right? Because it's important to do well, use the technology, right? Use the technology, right? Technology has allowed us to work in a remote and hybrid way. It can also be the solution to keeping us connected, right? So whether it's, it's Slack, whether it's G Suite, whether it's Microsoft Teams, whatever it is that you're using, don't just use it for sharing documents, Use it for connecting people and tying them back to your culture, right? Rewards and recognition, holding up the people who exemplify the behaviors that we say drive success, the, the teaching that we want to do, engaging people, right? I, I mentioned our app. You see a picture of it there, just a screenshot there. I'd mentioned the daily quick tip, 
right? That every single day I get a push notification with one thought to take with me is about my day, right? We're using technology to engage people in a simple and easy and, and not intrusive, right? An unobtrusive way. And yet it's persistent. It's effective because it happens over and over and over again. So you can push the messages through in the Slack channel, right? Through Teams, through G Suite, those sort of things, but use your technology creatively not just to you know, recognize people, rewards, that sort of thing, that's important, absolutely, but also in terms of like the daily and weekly messaging that drives your teaching and coaching of the behaviors that you've defined uh, that, that explain your culture. So those were our three actionable items. I know we're just about at time, so I'll leave you with this quote again and, and a thought and really a question for you that, you know, I, I said this is not the difference between success and failure, that rather this is about building a world-class organization, a championship one, an extraordinary organization. And so my question for you all to, to think about, and I mean this genuinely, not in a, in a manipulative way, is what type of organization are you building? Right? What is it that you're after? Because if you're just looking for good, you don't have to do these things. But if what you want is something different, if you want to build a championship organization, whether it's the methodology I've just explained or something else you've learned or come up with, there's just no way to do it without being intentional and systematic in terms of driving culture, especially considering the remote and hybrid environment that we're all facing, that we're all trying to manage and work our way through. So if you've got questions, I know we're at time, you can drop something in the chat, submit it as a question through Zoom. Here's my information, my email, my cell number, feel free to, to reach out to me, submit a question. I will get back to you. If you put it in the chat, I'll make sure that I get back to you and answer all of those questions. It gets saved with the recording. We're going to send a recording of this to all of you. If you'd like some time, whether you do it through the recording or you do it right now, there's the QR code. That's actually a direct link to my calendar. Uh, I'd love to answer your questions, meet with you, learn more about your organization and the culture that you are trying to drive. I thank you all for your time. I appreciate you so much. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. Take care. Thank you.